Hello and thank you for joining me for another episode of the Finish More Music podcast. So absolutely delighted we're joined today by a man who's covers the full spectrum of house, dips into techno, prolific producer, like constant level of, of top, top quality productions releasing on a who, who's who of the top labels. Um, and he has a really positive and opportunity based outlook to music and getting himself out there as well. So I'm delighted to have Demure with us um, for this episode. He's got a masterclass coming up inside of the FMM community as well. And we've announced that and the place went bonkers excited to uh, get undercover and, and see the projects and see all the magic. But we got an opportunity to learn an absolute ton now. So I want to make the most of every second of it, basically. Demure, thank you so much, buddy, for joining me for this. I'm super excited for this session. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I am I am as well as well as the coming masterclass too. Yeah, amazing. So one of the things we were, were literally talking about before I hit the record button on this that that kicks this off so beautifully was all, I'm always curious about people's habits and routines because the habits, routines and the processes are what builds the outcome. And you were kind of talking about the time you get up and all of this stuff. I don't, I don't want to kind of ruin the piece, but can you talk us through like a, a day in the life of you, a typical sort of day in the life of you and the studio and the things you do, please? Yeah, uh, you know what's funny with that we're talking about this. I I just like I I'm an avid reader, and I just finished reading a book called uh, Daily Routines. It's uh, I forget the uh, author's name, but it's uh, it highlights all of the routines of different um, creatives, like you know of yesteryear and today. So you know you're talking about people like Einstein and Tesla you know, what did they do throughout their routines and stuff. So I thought it was pretty cool that we're on this topic. But yeah, my my typical day, I'm up at about uh, 4.30 every morning. And uh, I'll take an hour, hour and a half just to do my own stuff, meditation, prayers, um, and just, uh, you know, uh, write out a specific plan for the day. You know, things things that I'm I'm keen on achieving that need to get done, or things that I missed the previous day and I carry into this day. It's you know, it's I don't have the book here with me, but it's basically a book of task. Um, you know, and then I do things like, you know, I, I mentioned meditation, but just listening to things that keep my mind right, like balance, motivating things. Uh, you know, it just they're reminders of where. Uh, I want to go. Uh, I'll do some brief studio stuff for two hours, you, you know, work out, have breakfast number two, because normally that early in the morning, I'm not trying to eat too heavy. I'll just have a shake, protein shake with chia seeds or something. Uh, and then after working out, yeah, shower, coffee, breakfast, review the list again, add anything taking the news quickly for about half an hour so by that time it's around nine ish and then from like nine to six it's pretty much studio with a couple of uh, <clears throat> uh minor breaks in between maybe some phone calls meetings email um the odd time i'll take a break like i'll go out, i'm in a condo so i'll go out and or, or towers, as you guys call them. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'll go out on the balcony, take in some fresh air, and uh, just get back at it. And normally, I'm shutting the studio down at six, but sometimes I'll just, depending on what's happening, you know, um, I I create more serendip uh, serendipitously, or ser yeah, I use the theory of serendipity to just sort of guide me through stuff and. As I'm going through that, sometimes it takes me a little later, but yeah, then I'm back in bed, usually between 8.30 and 9.30, and then we do it all over again. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's really interesting listening to that because it, there are so many striking similarities with what I do. I, the same as you, I get up, I meditate, I have, my breakfast is in two parts because I, I'm up early, I don't want to eat the whole thing in one go, 
and my breakfast, although it's not a shake, does include chia seeds. Um, <laughs> um, and I have a, I have my book that I, I plan the day and in the book. Uh, so I, one thing I'm interested in is the things you listen to for, for motivation. So I'll definitely uh, touch on that. But I have a book and I have certain mantras and things that I write in it every day repeatedly that are things that are important to me that keep my mind in the right place. So it's fascinating because it was, you know, although you can't, you can look in a mirror, you can't listen in one. It felt like I was listening in a mirror, like an echo almost of, of what I do. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned sort of listening to the motivational things. Is there anything that you you tend to go to? You know, it's, it's <laughs> to be quite frank, it's YouTube. Well, you know, it's I, I miss that piece. So affirmations is something I do. I have a stack of legal paper. I write my affirmations twice a day. So immediately when I get up and again, before I uh, go to bed. Um, and then there's the, the auditory part. So I just grab YouTube, like Google five minute motivation, boom. Right, because there is loads of stuff on there as well. Yeah, and some of the things like, I, I mean, I think some people might think it's corny, but it, it really isn't because you might hear, yeah, the same guys like uh, Dr. Miles Monroe, Tony Robbins, uh, uh, Mel, uh, Melanie Robbins as well, the five four three two one. Like, yeah, I thought that was funny, but it actually works. It does, like, yeah, I know. <laughs> it, like you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah, no, I I use it when I remember. That's the hilarious thing. Yeah, it like, works if I remember to do it. <laughs> but I because I actually think something on a serious note. I think something subconsciously happens. The more you've done that, your mind just says, "Oh, psh, let's just let's just insert this in here." But sometimes you do have to agitate it uh tom below is another one i enjoy his his journey is quite similar to mine you know like doing a you know a regular corporate job and then he said enough's enough i'm going to start my own nutrition company and he sold it for quite a large sum of money yeah so so i'm guessing what you were doing was law because you mentioned legal having a stack of legal paper yeah <laughs> <laughs> no, like, yeah i'm just talking like you know these I think I got it here, so when I left the company, I took a load of their paper with me. <laughs> oh, did you? Yeah, this stuff, this yellow. Yeah, no, that's what I was wondering if, if that's what you were saying. Well, yeah, I, just I got a stack of these, like, with all of uh, my affirmations. And of course, when things actually happen, uh, you know, I replace it with something else. You know, you know how it is, right? Yeah, so. yeah, totally. I and mean, I'll just quickly loop back to the five, four, three, two, one for any listeners who don't know what we're talking about. As a lady, Mel Robbins, who, although she she had a book on it. To be fair, I actually heard about this in a book called The Chimp Paradox, and I, I, you notice that this a lot when you read books. And um, I mean, if you haven't read this, uh, Demure, The Chimp Paradox is incredible books. I really do recommend picking that up. Professor Stephen Peters, I believe it is. Um, but he, it's like it's a paragraph at best in his book, and I, you notice this a lot when you read a lot of these books. And I do; I'm a prolific reader. How people ha have latched onto one sentence that somebody said in a much bigger piece, and then can extrapolate that into an entire book. <laughs> and so her thing is very simply a way to kind of short circuit the subconscious mind, which is if you're sitting like on the on the sofa and you're chilled out and you're like i really do need to get in the studio but there's that i uh, just I'm, I'm not moving type thing if you start counting down from five to one and the minute you start counting you actually get up you got to move with it that little period of time is enough just to get you activated to get your subconscious mind out the way and then once you're in motion like it's a piece of cake from there on in yeah that's precisely it so yeah I'll, I'll and I've, I've saved everyone. Sorry, Mel, but I've saved you all the reason <laughs> to buy the book. Um, <laughs> and, and that is that is how somebody can turn that into a book, which is uh, is absolutely incredible. Fair, fair play to. Her. So, yeah, I mean, some amazing resources there. Brilliant. So you have this amazing morning routine and I, we could probably do a whole podcast on it. And maybe at some point we can do one more on the spiritual side of things, because I think this is so fascinating for creatives when you get in the studio you've got that that chunk of time what's the first thing that you do what's the you know what drives your decisions and what you're going to do and how you're going to write music 
Yeah. Um, well, I, I have a pretty, my process has developed quite methodically over the years. It almost, I hate to say it, it, it almost sounds corporate in a sense, <laughs> but it is, it, it's very much, I'll come in and I'll review um, sketches that I've done. So like, I'll probably do two to three sketches a day. Um, and when I talk about sketching, it's very much like a, a painter or writer's approach. So in that book, Daily Routines, they talk about writers who set daily goals. Like I'm gonna write 500 words or a thousand words today of whatever, right? Um, so it's very much the same. I have a number of sketches, a ridiculous amount of sketches. Some of them happened several months ago because I just do it every day, right? And then uh, if it's not that kind of day to review, well, I'll look at the sketches and say, ooh, if I, if I immediately grasp onto it, I'll finish out the song. Um, I do a weekly production stream on my uh, Patreon as well. That's kind of force or five, four, three, two, one, the process of, okay, either uh, make a new sketch, finish a sketch, like arrange it into a song or, uh, you know, do final touches on songs you've actually finished arranging and then bounce it out as a pre-master. The, the brilliance of this process is that I'm always getting something done. You know, it's not, you know, so that's usually the mindset. I mean, the odd time, I think today will be one of those days, which is, no, actually it won't be because I need to record the stream uh, for the production uh, folks on Patreon today, but some days I'll just say, I'm going to sample stuff all day. So I have notes uh, in my phone, pictures of stuff I want to sample, um, and I'll just go sample it, put it in the bin. So again, when it comes time to do sketches, I just got a plethora of inspiring things to do. Great. So that the, the, the toolkit in that respect is is already there and we'll we'll get onto the the gear side of that but you have a bunch of samples all ready to go you know your gear you're going to sit in the studio and then you you give yourself that choice so i'll either make some more sketches or i'll pick something that i've already got and and get the job done is that right pretty much yeah yeah perfect so and then that keeps moving and you said it's it's kind of nine o'clock till six o'clock on a day where there are not other things to do and meetings and podcasts and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that's, big, that's big chunk of time. It could go longer. Uh, it's not unusual. You know, like high live and dirty was one of those moments. Uh, I got into a sketch later in the day and uh, uh, it was, the choice was already made, finish this straight away so i got that like uh start to finish it was two hours and it was done wow and what would is there like a typical and average length you think it takes to to finish a track or it really varies a lot oh uh, great question i mean it, if i had to total up all of the time i'd say three three four hours you know um if i just didn't you know do the spaces in between but there there's a beauty like something happens, I, at least for me, something happens when you just sketch music and ideas first, and then you step away from it. And what that allows me to do is, I, I think subconsciously your mind is still working on it. Personally, I don't know about anybody else, uh, or spiritually, whatever it is. Uh, I do believe that your 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 mind is is working on it. So the, from the time it hears it, it gives you all of the answers, whether it's a sketch you should pursue, uh, what else needs to be added, and lastly, how you should arrange the song. Like, um, I have uh, I have a sample, I heard it last night, I already know the whole, and it's unfortunate because it's, it's a modern day song today. I know the artist actually, and uh, it just won't be released until the 29th. But between now and the 29th, my, I know I'm working on the whole song end to end. I know exactly what I'm going to do. So once it's available, 
get it and, and all of the uh the sketches the ones that you choose not to move forward what happens to those you know they just sit there until another uh opportune moment you know um i'm trying to think of uh songs i've released oh yeah like for example uh on hot creations there's a there's a song called uh uh rawness beat three there are a series of sketches i did at sneaks villa and abisa oh gosh this must have been around 2015 and uh so i sat on his you know his patio there uh just doing all of these sketches and i was doing the sketches with a theme in mind for nathan barato and carlo leo's raw authentic label that's why they're called rawness beats one through two whatever and i think they went up to as much as 12 at 12 like actually full sketches and songs done um so you know we all know jamie took rawness beat three he actually passed on it a year and a half earlier and when we put the high alive and dirty ep together he's like oh yeah let, let me take that rawness beat three. and i just laughed about it so the reason why the reason why i'm bringing that up is to answer your question is those songs are assets to me you know sketches and full songs they're still assets to me sometimes you won't be able to uh, redeem the asset or realize the value of the asset until a later date and time um, but they're still assets so i i keep those things and sometimes i go back like i have a bunch of 2000 10 ish 2011 stuff which is when i just returned to music that i'm like oh I, I really need to put these forward like so they're they're still there yeah and i love that I've, I've never heard anyone speak about it in that way I, I i absolutely love metaphors i think they really help to deepen like your understanding and point out different perspectives and this idea that they're you know, it's not money in the bank necessarily, but it's assets and you saying that you might not be able to redeem this one, might not be able to get the return on that just yet, but it's still an asset and its day most likely is going to come at some point. I think that's such a beautiful way of putting it because often people think, well, I didn't really like that that loop or that sketch or that Ooh. idea. And it goes over there and it, it may be just be kind of forgotten instead of thinking well it, it's not for today but that will come good and i've got all of this stuff kind of in the bank so to speak over there that's such a great way of thinking about things um and listening to you discussing the sketching thing that's it's actually kind of the backbone of the stuff that i teach as well and i okay. agree with you the time i i say that one of the important things is time and distance from the sketches so the time piece and i find listening to the sketch somewhere other than the studio can be great like if you're going to work out or you're in the car or you're doing whatever they all sort of trigger a different way of looking at it and, and fire up the the creative juices and i also think it's really powerful because it takes the pressure off Yes. because this not like this thing i'm working on now has got to be done and it's got to be you know it's got to be a finished masterpiece it's like it's a sketch i'm playing i'm just i'm jamming out ideas stuff is just coming up right now and then we'll see where we are with that later and that's cool yeah and you and you'll find that when you when you have that mindset of uh you know the these are moments in time i'm present in what's happening in, in the level of creativity you're okay to say to answer the flip side of your question that you know what i'm not gonna bother with that you know you'll be okay even with the time away and you come back to it and it's like Ugh, i don't know what i was thinking i have a lot of those too and the fortunate part about it is that it 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 goes into your bucket of what not to do and what you don't want out of your creativity um and they and that number starts to shrink in terms of the 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 sketches you're going to put in the bin uh versus the ones you're going to move forward with yeah and i think a lot of people operate from the belief that doing something like that is wasting time oh if i create all these things and some of them aren't you know aren't ever going to be good enough then i'm wasting time doing it but that that belief is it is the illusion because 
by writing all of the sketches you are as you said always permanently in motion and you actually end up with the diamonds and the gems and the things that you wouldn't get if you'd made far fewer of these things and tried to hold like the magic moments like you were talking about the track that come together in like a couple of hours yeah. if you were holding on to each thing that moment may never have actually come to you because you were being precious about something that perhaps was never going to be as good as that you know Absolutely. I, I, I think it all feeds into the investment of, uh, you know, hard work will always trump talent and, and uh, passion will always trump strategy. Uh, so I, I just believe in that. Like, it's just, it, it really, because it, it starts to use investment terms, it, it starts to compound, you know, and you just have this plethora of stuff available, you know, to you. So yeah totally so we talked to we touched on the the like going out sampling things i know that you've got a bunch of hardware that you're really into in the studio as well mm -hmm. what what's your setup like and how has it changed over the years yeah uh great question so my my setup now is uh uh what i would call a balanced mix of uh, outboard gear versus uh you know what's in the box stuff uh and it's kind of 360 for me when I when I started making music, like, you know, back in the day, it was Cubase and it was all midied up to a bunch of different gear and samplers weren't in the box yet. You know, uh, I had an, an old Akai sampler. This is before the 750 stuff. Uh, I forget what it was called the S612 or something. Anyway, it only had like eight seconds of sample time. And you could get more sample time out of it, the lower you degraded the quality of the sample, which is funny. Uh, and uh, I had a, a Korg S2000, another Korg drum machine, the Triple D1, really old school stuff, all synced to MIDI. And I pushed those things to a Roland uh, VS1880, which was a digital recorder, like is about I'd say is about the size of, you know, like 60 centimeters in length. And, it's, you know, it's a pretty good compact size of tracks. So you could get like 48 tracks out of it, I believe. And I would just dump all this the stuff to it. Like those were the days where if you made a sound on a keyboard or something, you couldn't shut it off. <laughs> you couldn't <laughs> shut the gear off because you would lose whatever you're working on. So you go to bed, get up the next morning and, and finish it off. And uh, yeah, and I just sort of evolved into then Reason came out and then I got into Logic Pro and Logic Pro just offers me a nice hybrid of stuff. So I'd say, yeah, I have, it, it's funny. I, I went kind of 360, but I got a good balance now. So, you know, I got some good, since because i think the richness and the sound of them like as just before we started this podcast i read a mr g interview and it's the first thing he does and i'm actually looking at this my deep mind 12 uh which is also analog and yeah he was like fire up all your analog stuff first and leave it on for about an hour because it actually sounds better it's like what's he talking about and he's actually right so yeah, yeah i got a chance good... to warm up yeah I got a good balance of that and it has affected my sound quite positively. It's a nice way to come back 360 with things. And how often do you add something new to the studio, whether it's software, hardware, and what's the criteria for bringing something new into to what is already an existing established workflow? Yeah. Awesome. Great question. Um, you know, I, um, I'm not a gear freak. Uh, I wouldn't consider myself a gear freak. I'm not the type of person, oh man, that's new. I got to get it in my studio. Um, I'm the type of person where I think about where do I want to go sonically? And then I go out and find the things that help achieve that. So for example, UAD uh, sound cards and plugins completely deliberate. I was on uh, Apogee sound card before using waves plugins. And I was like, man, I want a more rich and punchy sound on what, you know, on whatever genres I'm doing, whether it's, you know, house or 
techno or tech house and UAD fulfilled that need. So it's quite an investment. <laughs> For those of you that use UAD products, you, you do know that, you know, you could get an Apollo twin and then you're like, geez, I need more DSP. So I ended up getting a, an Apollo eight. Uh, I'm just reading it here, a quad to get more DSP and, you know, so it just fulfills, I, I just look at what will fulfill the need and then I go out and get it. Right. Last, and then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I, I was just curious because I know that there'll be a lot of people who sort of think, well, this thing might fulfill it and then they buy it and then they play around with it for 30 minutes and go, well, I didn't get what I wanted out of that. So they go and buy something else and buy something else. So do you have a strategy once it arrives in the studio that, to, that it gets a proper road test? How do you think about that once the gear is actually there in your hands? Oh, yeah, yeah. So like the music store, what we have out here is a franchise called Long McQuaid. And it's a place I, I think every artist and producer, and DJ can attest to this. There's just certain places you want to avoid because you know if you go in there, you're going to spend a whack of money. So I only go in there <laughs> when I know I'm comfortable to spend money if I see something that will fall into, you know, something that just lights me up, you know, where I can actually visualize and see it playing a role. Like my last purchase uh, was uh, outboard gear purchase was my Moog uh, subsequent 37. And I knew um, that was going to play a pivotal role in terms of very warm, deep, uh, and uh, intricate bass lines, like things I can craft. Like it, it is the it is it is the instrument that is the uh, uh, the the dominant bass force in the song called "Shroom Tripping" I did for. Um, uh, solo announce the Solaro uh, guys label and you know every time I fire it up and I'm like okay let's see what baseline you come up with I'm always impressed with it but that's an example I went into the music store not necessarily knowing about it and it was there on display and I was playing around with it and I left and I just said oh yeah I'm gonna have to purchase that so I got <laughs> that one's coming I, on. I said I'm coming back for it <laughs> Just keep it there. Here's a deposit. I'll I'll grab it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. I love it. So I mentioned at the at like the top of the show how prolific you are. I mean, you know, pages and pages and pages of tunes on Beatport alone. If you if anybody goes on there and, and checks it out and all sorts of genres and, and or styles of house, it's you know, it's I think anyone who's into their house music and underground music could do a lot worse than just grabbing a cup of coffee and just sitting listening to all of your tunes because it's not a carbon copy thing. There's things to listen to and it, you know, it's a it's for me anyway, it's a pleasure, it's a joy just to go through that kind of selection of music. Um and you've got your releases, you know, we've mentioned Hot Creations and you know, Desolate, Rob Soul, there's all of, all of these big labels that you're on. But you did take a like a hiatus of 10 years out from the the big music piece and you come back and you're super prolific i wondered what what fueled the hiatus and, and what got you back and how did you come back with like such gusto yeah a, a great question yeah you know i i left music probably around two yeah it was 2000 and uh, a series of things were happening I think between 2000 and 2001, the, the first big piece was iTunes. Uh, and the reason why I'm mentioning that um, is because I, I was making music like out of high school and into my early years in college or uni, as you guys would call it. Um, and I was doing quite well. Like uh, I put the stuff on vinyl, sell a thousand copies, five bucks a pop each us from the distributor and the exchange that time i'm i'm in canada toronto canada was well over 30 percent so you're talking about a kid making like 10 grand us a month from you know these records uh every time i'd release something so it was beautiful and then itunes came in and it turned the industry upside down like songs that it i would say that was the single most foremost event that really took a large chunk out of the uh, out of the music industry in terms of a dramatic shift in the financials, 
because I started noticing distributors couldn't pay me anymore. Um, they were sending records back because people are just using Napster, which is another focal point, um, like being able to download MP3s and music. And they're just like, you know, we have all this vinyl, but we can't sell it because people are downloading music. And then iTunes comes around with a convenient way to listen to music. And they're like, oh, by the way, we got the store and you can buy it for dirt cheap. So that was the first thing. The other piece is I was going through a pretty heavy divorce at the time and uh the third piece was uh 9-11 when that took a nice well i don't want to say nice but it took a dramatic punch to the travel industry so it was it was just quite chaotic right and i just said like gosh these are material changes and it's going to take some time to recover from i'm just going to uh step out of music for a while uh and i'm glad i made that decision because i think conversely um in this time now where the our our 9 11 sort of situation today is COVID, right in a way like it's had a dramatic yeah, impact on everybody's lives especially in the industry and i said okay i've sort of i've seen this before but I know through history when dramatic things happen and if you're prepared for it, it's important to push through it and you can lay down other foundational items. So yeah, that's what it was. Those were the things that drove me away from uh, releasing music uh, at that time. Uh, and, I, and I enjoyed the time away. I, I worked a, a normal job. I didn't really love that so much, but um, uh, I, you know, I got to go into clubs and listen to what was happening and, and I was kind of glad I stepped back from it because there was a lot of electro and just stuff I just didn't like. Didn't you know? float your boat, yeah. So what was the catalyst for you coming back? What was the, the moment that you kind of flicked the switch and said, right, boom, I'm, I'm back in this 100 miles an hour? Yeah, uh, yeah, I, uh, I stumbled into a club called Footwork here in Toronto uh around i want to say 2009 2008 2009 and what we had were the junkies so vince and val here in toronto were playing nathan barato and carlo leo and the reason why that's so profound is the club also hosted other djs like uh Derek carter jesse perez um, and I caught those shows. I missed the Derek Carter one, but I, I caught the Jesse Perez one. But my point is, is that they introduced a fire in the sound of Tech House, you know. And, you know, when I saw Jesse Perez, he was playing that swinging, groovy, jacking type of house stuff. Um, and I was like, man, I, you know, I know how to, I can make this stuff. I can contribute. I got to get back into music. And that's, that was, that was the moment. You know, uh, and uh, you know the rest is sort of history from there. They just started building and building and releasing uh, good records. Yeah, totally. So if we, I guess, kind of touch back on the the COVID, the pandemic situation, and the the lessons you learn, because obviously your approach this time, we're in a, a situation where the pandemic's coming. It has hit the creatives across the world in various different ways, particularly performers. Um, and it's created a, a list of situations that are problems. And some of those legitimately are problems. That's true. This has happened. This has happened. This has happened. And I'm affected in a, a certain way. And as you mentioned previously, when all these things happened, your thing was like, there's the problem. Step back. I'm kind of out of here for a bit. And now instead you've so taken a very different framework, which is okay, there are these list of things that are happened. But rather than stay in the problem, I'm going to shift this and say, well, where are the opportunities here? What opportunities has this bought me? I've got maybe more time on my hands than I had in some respects. Some of these problems could be opportunities. And I know that you're you're super busy online. I mean, it would touch straight away, I think on the 
the Beatport takeover in a second for your for your label. Um, but also like you're on Twitch, YouTube, you've got your Patreon account. So can you just talk to your approach now, the things that you learned and how they impacted your approach? Because you are one of the artists who's when I actually spoke to you about this when we, we talked a few weeks back, you said, mm -hmm. you know, I'm I'm kind of thriving in this. I'm finding ways. And so it'd be great for you to to talk about all of those because I think that kind of positive message helps a lot of people who are feeling a little bit stuck or a little bit down about the situation at the moment. Yeah, certainly. Um listen, I, I don't uh I do not want to forego the, the reality of COVID and how it's touching people at a, at a deep uh, personal level in terms of seeing people dying around you, um, having close friends or relatives be affected by this and actually passing away. Um, like I had this, just the other day, I had a long conversation with Kerry Chandler about how it's impacting him. And, you know, he's in that bucket, he's seeing friends and people passing away that he can't attend their funerals because of this thing. Um, however, uh, we the, the conversation shifted to my core belief here is listen, like the difference with this situation today is we have the technologies in place that artists who were in the, you know, the 1940s and 50s, and even the 70s, where there was, you know, uh, very substantial wars happening, you know, World War II, Vietnam. And to be an artist then, you needed a major deal to get your music out. And those deals weren't necessarily great deals, but people still had the need to be creative. And those who pushed through it floated to the top when things were over. That is, I, I actually think it's a lot, to, to be quite frank with you. Um, if you're able to push through adversity, um, what's on the other side of that is huge rewards. So that was my thought process on the bed of we have technologies that enable artists to say, this is my content. I'm going to bundle monetize it and push it out to people who are who are interested in it. And I only need uh, a thousand people to be interested in that theory uh you know that's the thousand fan theory um and i and i think you know knowing the technologies are here we're in the richest time to be able to do that uh that was my motivation is to push through it and it's and it's proving true like you know the youtube when we started at the top of the pandemic just maybe a couple of months before that i had 500 subscribers just yesterday i checked it's at 2080 just about um and then from there uh you know we have followers on twitch twitch i don't really do too much uh just because i'm more interested in monetizing the content but the simple act of placing one of my weekly production stream episodes there for free at the top of each month and, and then i take it down after a few days pushes people to Patreon. And Patreon is an amazing story where uh, I create content, be it videos, music, opinion post, and people subscribe. They pay for that to be part of that community in addition to uh, Discord as well. Uh, so I, th I think, you know, that's the motivation. We have the enablers in place that allow artists to push through these types of moments. And I think in some respects as well, there's a, there's a whole new skill set here that you are learning and having the opportunity to grow as well, because there is a big market in peace. Um, and for a lot of artists to, uh, you know, they're, they're hammering away and writing great music in the studio and then they're touring and that that's super busy. And then there are other people who might be taking care of other different things for them, or there are in fact streams and channels that may never get tapped into. And if you do have that extra time on your hands, there's a chance to up level in the skills whilst you explore all of these technologies and, and methods for reaching people. And as you mentioned, it's a global audience. And it's, there are people all over the world, our community, you know, there are, we have people in 
probably pretty much every country on the planet. There'll be a few that there aren't, but you know, they're everywhere. Bulk, of course, US, UK, Europe, but we have people all over the world who are accessing the music, the lessons, getting involved and collaborating, which is something I'd, I'd love to touch on with you in a second. But there is a huge opportunity available here for people who want to learn and, and tap into it. And I think you're, you're doing a great job of it. How, how have you built up your Patreon? What's the, the story behind that? Because that is a great way to monetize when you've got the, the skills and, and abilities that somebody like you has. Yeah, uh, the, the how behind that is really the, the content. But my, my ethos for Patreon is, uh, listen, it's music, knowledge and culture. So I'm promoting my content, which is obviously music. I release exclusive things there. I, I do reverse things like uh, we do a poll and say to uh, our Patreon subscribers, hey, uh, each month you're gonna get a free track. So for this particular month, vote on the track you want me to take away from Bandcamp, <laughs> you know? And I permanently remove it to ban from Bandcamp and uh, on Patreon, they they get it for free and and they get the they get the um, the opportunity to say like you can't get this anywhere else. You you get it from here, right? So that that's the one great thing from a music perspective. Uh, knowledge wise, uh, I do the weekly production stream. And I have a bunch of other products that feed into the knowledge piece, similar to uh, what your organization is doing, Keith. So, you know, things very much geared towards the, hey, I'm an aspiring DJ and producer, well, mainly producer in this case. Uh, people can access a masterclass product for my Patreon, uh, which comes with a manual and 12 uh, detailed videos on that. And then they can also um, get into more of um, like, I'd say it's a little more intense, but monthly I schedule one-on-ones with people in my VIP program for 15 minutes, just to give them pointers on, you know, not only their tracks, but what they could be doing with their career and where they aspire to go. You know, these are people who are already producing tracks and are further along and just want to push things a bit further. And then the last piece that is super intense is my elite program. Um, I only made five positions available and uh, they pay about a, a thousand US for the year. You know, they get the masterclass uh, video and manual two to three, well, two hours of direct one-on-one -on -one time with me, which we decide to, you know, divvy up. And then, uh, you know, uh, I'm getting them EP ready. And one of the guys, he's pretty much good to go. He's ready to start releasing uh, music. Uh, and I just saw like a random post from uh, one of my students just saying like, I've shaved so much time off my learning curve and I'm producing music now, thanks to your approach and teaching processes. And, and that's the best thing because I have a direct hand in influencing what sounds will be out there uh, in the culture. And that's the culture piece. You know, I, I do sample packs that are only exclusive to Patreon as well. So Patreon is, is huge because, you know, I can think of something, envision it, package it, put it together, and you could choose to buy into it or not. The, and the tech is already there for you, as you were saying, that the, it's right. built, it's done, the platform, that somebody else has done that piece of the heavy lifting. Whereas years ago, you had to get a website built and you had to get all the all the uh, the payment systems and everything has to be connected and, and built in. And now it's like yeah. this, this piece of it, the puzzle is done for you. And I think from the, an artist's perspective as, as well, you know, I'm I'm sure that when you... You know, you, you received that message saying that somebody shaved all this time off, you've saved all that time or somebody is now ready to get an EP to get out there for you to contribute to other people's personal development. It's a, like, I mean, it's what lights me up. It's why I do what I do. But that's something else that is now you're getting to do as well as all of your creative work. Absolutely. That that's you can't put a price on that. Right. That is, that is so rewarding. And, um, you know, when we talk about 
you know, laws, like, you know, the, the, the more you're looking for ways to serve people, the, you know, the rewards come back to you tenfold in a positive manner. And that's a perfect example of it. Man, like how, how I wish I, <laughs> I'd be very interested in if I started to make music in this time, wow, where I could literally go out and reach, you know, my favorite artists and learn from them, get specific tips and push it forward. It's, it's an amazing time to be in. And, and that's where, you know, I saw that opportunity and I just went full steam ahead. Yeah, totally. Now, one of the th things that I know is in the, the course, you talked about the, the course, you've got the book and the 12 detailed videos and something else that you and I have talked about and we have sort of very similar views on is the idea of people finding their own sound and being able to, to have their kind of unique footprint. And I think that it is one of these situations with this industry. It's very fast moving. A sound becomes a flavor of the month. One DJ creates something. It sounds great. A load of copycats come in and that kind of becomes flavor of the moment. And it's tempting to try and follow that. Or there's a piece of gear of the moment. There's nearly always something's getting pushed as, as the thing, right? That's and, and it's really easy to get sucked into all of those bits. It's been like that for many, many years. It's not just now. It's this, you know, our industry has been like this for a long time. Um, do you have any tips for people on not just finding your sound, but how to avoid, you know, getting caught in the, I guess I'd call it shiny object syndrome, right? Of going, oh, this, this sound is the thing. And now I'm, I'm going to go over there instead of being true to themselves. Yeah, that, that, that's funny. You're bringing me back to my corporate life, man. We call it shiny bunny. Look here. Uh, is that, <laughs> is that what that was? <laughs> the shiny bunny. Wow uh okay yeah my my thought on it is uh first and foremost you absolutely have to make a commitment to the fact that what you have to offer means something it, it's a value there's nobody else like you it means something as long as you are committed to your craft through discipline um and uh i describe discipline as doing the things you have to do, whether you feel like it or not. Like, as long as you are disciplined in your craft, you'll continue to flourish and you don't, and you need not worry about the, the flashy, the shiny bunny right now, I think in our industry is uh, minimal tech house, swinging, bumpy, minimal tech house. And there's some people who do it very well, like Cricket, Andre Simon from Ecuador. Um, but then there's just the vast majority of people who just are doing it because they think they need to do it to be noticed. It's not who they are artistically. So I'd say be committed to the point of you have value and your uniqueness will drive that forward. Now, in terms of finding your sound, um, yeah, I I see it as just being inspired by the things that inspire you and learning more and getting very comfortable with why they inspire you. So if it's Louis Armstrong, learn who inspired Louis Armstrong and made him what he is or was, right? And then just build from there and then be comfortable that you can put a spin in your in own interpretation on that that adds value again uh, that's honestly when i returned to music and i made that commitment it's been the number one saving grace for me because it it's allowed me not to limit myself to one style of house you know i could go into all these other genres because to me they're just interpretations of things that inspire me and if you get into it great if you don't that's fine too but that's my value it's me yeah, that's great. So I was going to ask you about the, the different styles. So you've, you've kind of covered that really well. And the other thing I'd add to this, because I, I mean, the thing that you said there, I love was like the first step is to believe you have something to offer. I think that is that is such a fantastic message. So I just very quickly wanted to underline that if, you know, people listening to this show, if there's something I was going to, you were going to write down, <laughs> that would be one of the big moments for me. I think that was really profound what you just said. And also, as well as when you listen to things and you're like, well, I really like this and looking into it is also the 
well, I don't like that and why can also be a really powerful thing of saying, well, that's not floating my boat. What is it about it? And that sort of cuts those things out and lets you go deeper into this this direction, which I think is great. Now, this kind of ties into something that I mentioned I'd, I'd like to touch on earlier, which is collaborating, because mm. we've obviously got the idea of different people's influences coming together. We've talked about the global possibility. One of, We do a lot of collaboration stuff inside of the community, and it's amazing because people on completely different sides of the planet are able to collaborate and build pieces of music. And sometimes we match people up in a sort of similar taste. Sometimes we deliberately say, look, you are going to get chucked in with someone random here. You might make house and they might make Psytrance. Are you up for it? And people are like, yeah, hell, let's just see what drops out of this thing. And um, obviously you've collaborated with a, a bunch of um, people. You mentioned uh, DJ Sneak earlier as well. What's your approach to collaborating and how is that different? different from your approach when you work on your own and bring just your own influences to the table? Yeah, uh, great question, man. Jeez, it's probably one of the best interviews I've had in a long time. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> Buzzing. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of cookie cutter questions and this is this is great. So, so collaboration, um, my approach to collaboration is uh, it's, it's a little it's a little, I don't want to use the word finicky. It's, it's sensitive. And the reason why I'm using the word sensitive is because my approach to collaborations is I want to be able to work with someone who, where there's a musical chemistry, but at the same time, I want to understand or at least anticipate in the relationship that this is a person that could stretch my creativity. Um, you know, uh, yeah, that's really it. So like DJ Sneak, that was a slam. That was a slam dunk. We've done many different songs together. He's got over 30 years in the game. Our similarities are the fact that we are very sample heavy producers, but he obviously, in my opinion at the time had a formula or he was doing something that um, allows him to continue to be so productive and prolific. And he does like the first session I had with him, you know, you go to the studio, he's got like three or four, five, five different beats he's working on all at the same time. Like, really? it's crazy. Like they're all up. He like work on this and then jump. Like I personally don't do that, but in terms of, output that's how he gets to his sketching you know because he's got you know he's got two kids wife and that's his process and uh, i'm like wow that's 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 crazy but that's how he works very sample heavy he'll he'll do the same thing like me take a day and just sample stuff that's what i learned from that relationship that's what stretched not only my musical creativity but also just the you know, just the process, it added value to me in, in that sense. So I, I don't do a lot of collaborations specifically for that reason. And I don't want to come across as egotistical here. I just think if I'm going to collaborate with someone, there first and foremost has to be a musical chemistry. And then I got to feel like there's something in that relationship that could stretch me. Like Derek Carter, that's a no brainer. Uh, and uh, I'm still waiting to do that, but <laughs> we'll see what there comes back with. I mean, well, but, I mean, know. this in itself is good. How do you, how do you, how did those connections come about with the collabs you have done? How do you, you do you approach people? What's the the typical route that gets you into that situation? Yeah, it's I I see collaborations as a real relationship. So for me, it's like, hey, I I play your music. Uh, like Cynthia is a collaboration I'm working on and I actually approached her. Uh, most collaborations I do, people are approaching me. Um, but I approached her because I actually play her music. I, I know she produces her own music um, and it like it speaks to me, right? So I'm like, oh, I think this would be interesting to do and she's totally for it, you know? Uh, so that's one I expect to learn from that relationship because it's just the 
you know, you're playing each other's music, you're supporting one another, and then you're like, mm, let's see what happens if we merge the two, what can come of it? So I think that's where the relationship begins is an enjoyment of one another's music and approach. And then you say, okay, great. What, it'll be interesting to see what we can do together. Cool. One, it's just sort of occurred to me here. One of the things I, I wanted to touch on earlier and, and I didn't, but links into this kind of nicely with the, the two different workflows of your solo productions and something you're collaborating on. Mm -hmm. How do you know when to call something finished? Mm. I, for me, it's, it's just the feeling, you know, um, and I'm sorry that if that sounds like a very, <laughs> well, uh, all of your answers have been absolutely incredible so far. So if, if you've got to leave know. one, that's got a trail of breadcrumbs, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it really is. It, it really is a feeling. It's, it's the same feeling as I get when I'm going to just sign a piece of music to my label for Vare underground or when I revisit a sketch and know, Oh, I have, I absolutely have to finish this. You have to trust your intuition. Like I had a mentor tell me, uh, you, she was like, you know, 80% of the best decisions that you will ever make has a strong component of intuition. And, you know, I don't want to get too uh, atmospheric here about, you know, there's some scientists that don't believe there's an intuition. It's a, your, your intuition is really a culmination of experiences and which ones you thought worked, you know, whatever. Um, I do <laughs> if you, if you want to go that deep, we can get into the whole, there's no free will. You don't get any choice in anything you do determination oh, route. And then that's yeah. what I said. I think you and I have got another podcast coming somewhere. That's, that's a real deep discussion. It's going to be cool. Yeah, and, I love it. And I, I welcome it because there any, any opportunity to exchange ideas, uh, where you can learn and grow from is something we should all endeavor to do. It's like mastery. You always pursue it, but you'll never get it, but you, you grow as a result. Um, anyway, I digress there a little bit, but yeah, my point on, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry, a little bit of me interrupting. I do apologize. Oh, was, oh, we're oh, talking oh. about uh, the finishing of the tracks and intuition. Oh, yeah. 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 So sorry. Thank you. Yeah. So, the, the whole thing aspect of it being a feeling and, and intuition is really what's worked very well for me. So uh, that's what I feel. And that's the interesting thing about collaborations where you could stretch is someone will say, oh, I'm not too sure it's done. You know, uh, maybe add this piece and let me know what you think. You, you do have those situations and then you say, oh, I've learned something. And you can push that for but for me it's it's normally it's just a feeling yeah totally so we've covered a load of ground there are a couple of things i'd like to just kind of tie up at the end which is more general advice for people or just how you see things at the moment for people who are, are coming up through the through the ranks sort of the, the people on the lower rungs of the ladder the future generations of dance music and one of the things that i i absolutely adore about our culture is it does have a family feel to it in the underground that everyone is so i say everyone generally people are very supportive and, and looking out for one another when we're talking about artists so two questions really the first one is what in your eyes at the moment do you feel are the biggest challenges for people who are sort of climbing the ladder yeah, I, I think the number one challenge for people is just uh, just climbing the ladders just to feel like, am I being seen? Or, you know, are, are people enjoying my art and consuming it? You know, I, I think that's the biggest challenge because what, what's the stat at Bport? Like 30,000 tracks they receive a week to release. Um, so the, the level of entry is... It's extremely low like technology you know the one upside of technology is that it enables independent people to monetize their content but the downside is is, is that it's made it very easy for people to go out just buy a laptop and put a beat together and say oh yeah that's that's a track and actually release it so trying to cut through all of that saturation is the number one challenge and 
Um, I think the best thing people could do is, like I said earlier, is believe in the value that they have something to contribute. And through discipline, um, that would, discipline really is the guarantor, really, of making sure your stuff truly adds the value that you believe you can add. If you if you just go in with, oh, I'm somewhat talented and you're not really disciplined, you're not really putting investment into your stuff, it's going to come through in your sound, you know? So that's what I, because it was the same for me. Uh, no one knew who I was and I, I didn't have loads of money to spend on PR and I still think PR is a ridiculous thing. Um, and I just let the music speak for itself and that's what you know, it's going to sound like a typical answer, but that's what it is. The output of your belief in adding value and discipline generates quality music, which is the sustainable character that pushes you through the saturation and gets you noticed. Totally. It's that uh, everybody, 4.30, okay? Set your alarms, 4.30. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> a few people going oh man give me a break 4 30. <laughs> but know, no man. i'm but totally that's... down with you it's it's that day to day and it's the to touch on the discipline and my definition of discipline is again strikingly similar to yours it's it's um choosing what you want to do and not what you feel like doing and sometimes right. those two things are the same but very often what we feel like doing is of course an easier route a more comfortable route and what we want to do is that list that you wrote in the morning that yeah. that before you started that list is the stuff that really needs to get done because writing down something uncomfortable is much easier than doing it when it comes to the that moment and that's yeah. the discipline point it's it's spotting that being aware of that and saying that's what's written down that's what i'm gonna do yeah i'm tired yeah there's a great show on netflix yeah there's a yeah. you know there's whatever <laughs> going on that's what you feel like doing but doing what you want to do is where the rewards are and the more you can do it and the more days you do it and the more you believe your discipline so the i get in some ways it's not necessarily that it becomes easier but we always protect our identity and if you're the kind of person who gets that list done and who takes the hard choices then you're you're going to want to protect that yeah no i'm the under guy who, or the girl who steps up to the the plate and does that but yeah totally yeah. the discipline and i love this authenticity uh piece that you talk about and believing in your own value again i, I just think that's such a, a profound thing so if we round it out with a like my, my one kind of last question which is always the if you were to kind of jump back in time and be able to give yourself one piece of advice if there was like one thing that you're like listen do this or behave like this or avoid this even what would that that one thing be Oh, uh, the number one thing, I guess it's a little bit of a two-parter, but the number one thing for me would be uh, just, you know, patience is, is, uh, is really a gift. It really is. It helps you, you know, trust. Patience helps you to truly trust and believe in yourself uh, to keep going. Uh, so there's that. And then there's just the whole thing of um, that's a spinoff of patience, which is, you know, do I feel like I got to do what this other person is doing? Like, I, I'm now in a place where I really don't, I'm in my own little bubble, I'll be frank, you know, but there was a time where it wasn't. I would play these games like, hey, you know, this person is trying to play my music and oh yeah, I'm, I'm cooler than you because I got this amount of plays on this, you know. I used to play those stupid games, but I, I could care less about them. Like, I don't care if some retailer comes out with a list and says, oh, yeah, you're you're the number one producer, because really and truly, they don't mean anything, you know, when it comes to your artistry and how people are receiving your artist, your music, your content. It, it means nothing. Uh, it doesn't get you more gigs. It, it doesn't make you better than somebody else. It's all an ego stroking exercise and has nothing to do with 
with my my interest, my core interest is to be uh, a person in a constant pursuit of mastery and enabling uh, a degree of value that inspires others infinitely. That's that's my ethos. So you want to put me on some stupid list and say, oh, yeah, this person is so and so because ooh, I sold 20 more tracks than somebody else on your site. It, it means nothing. So. I love that. And it's that's the, the intrinsic, extrinsic motivation thing as well in that what you've just said and what you hold on to there, which is like a, a kind of sounds like a core mantra for who you are. That's something that's there every single day. The chart yeah. thing is like the the money, the fame, the fortune. And, and if that's gone, then then it's like, well, who am I? Whereas if what you're is lighting you up and is inspiring you is is this thing of every day I'm learning towards the mastery, every day I'm looking to contribute to other people. That's always there. The good days, the bad days, the charting, the not charting that thing is is like the nucleus of who you are and is this is the thing that will always sustain you i think that's amazing absolutely like you know we we have living examples of this where and i know some people who who did this they they did things that they weren't proud of you know when commercial edm came around all the glitz and and glamour of that and, and the dollars attached to it they wanted to be a part of that and it's like I'm so glad I didn't get sucked into that because really we're, you know, that, that was a moment in time and it's gone, it's, it's gone, you know, there, yeah, commercial EDMs are around, but it's certainly not an art form. I would say is widely respected. Like people are like, Oh yeah, you're, you're a commercial EDM artist. Like, no, like there, and I know there's a number of producers who are embarrassed to have participated in that. And, and it's, basically wasted their time they've lost a ton of credibility and they're fighting to get it back uh you, you know and it's almost like they have to go through this whole rediscovery of who they truly are and i'm i'm so glad i never got sucked into that and nor wasted my time in that it's actually been the thing that's propelled me into the new and next chapter of my artistry and my life which is ownership you know i'm i'm going back and getting all a lot of my masters back and making bundling the content up to monetize it uh, a lot of the discussions happily went very well uh, some are a little more sensitive than others depending on the label but it's the right thing to do and i think you know um having just had that ethos has allowed me to pursue those conversations with uh with a degree of passion and vigilance that is necessary uh, for the future. Yeah, I think the the thing that's really shone through from the beginning of our conversation right to to where we are now, pretty much closing things out, is the degree of staying true to yourself and being in integrity with yourself. Mm -hmm. So it's one thing identifying the the mantra and the who you are. It's another thing holding yourself accountable to that and being and living that every single day. And so many times when we've we've been talking about all the different things and we've covered a, a lot of ground, it's been amazing. Thank you. It, it seems to kind of segue back to that. It seems to keep flowing back to this this core central thing of who you are and how that connects to your art. Yeah, that they're really. Yeah, that's absolutely true, uh, Keith, and uh, and that's why I, I use this term in a lot of my videos sometimes called uh, people will always um, support and buy into honest music. Um, and what I mean by that is when it's music that you, you know, you, you put the discipline in be, behind your, you're, you're actually passionate about this and you're pushing it forward. You're not doing it like, especially in this industry it's amazing but we do have people who do it they're just like oh you know what i'm gonna calculate and make this kind of song that i think people conceptually could get into and it has nothing to do with how they feel uh and the passion behind it so what ends up happening is they do the the, the project and it, it does nothing it goes nowhere it's like yeah it's a nice little cover tune you did but it's not you 
you know we want we want your music and, and that's and that's why i say call it cookie cutter or cover tunes that's why those people who are just following the sheep so to speak don't cut through the saturation because they're not doing things with a degree of patience discipline and honesty to produce authentic content yeah i think mr c calls them the sheeple i think yeah. is the is the is the, is the term that he uses uh, like be, beautifully phrased but yeah you know be yourself everyone else is taken i think that's oscar Wilde, right um i'm not sure if someone might uh, if if it's not someone will let me know i promise you by by the bucket load we'll uh, we'll be told if i've got that one wrong and um, <laughs> Listen, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. What have you got coming up in the next few months? What can people uh, expect from you? How can they get involved in the stuff that you're doing? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, musically, um, I have a uh, solo release on my label with Junior Sanchez Culture that's coming out uh, in February. Then I think the next month, uh, these guys, they, the names keep coming up, Nathan Barato and Carlo Leo. Uh, I have uh, another EP being released on the Roth Antic label. I think this is my third EP with them, which is cool. And uh, I, I, I guess learning wise, you know, we're doing the master class, which is exciting. Uh, and that's coming up as well. And just, you know, loads of stuff. Uh, February 5th is a big day. That's uh, I'm releasing another sample pack on my Patreon. In addition to, uh, I think I'm going to do a massive release on my band camp. This is band camp Friday. So old, you know, masters have had them bundling those up and throwing a whole album up on there. So, yeah, there's a number of exciting things. And after this call, there's some stuff with Heist. Uh, uh, I've been chopping a number of tracks around and I think they're interested. So it's really, I mean, I got nothing to complain about, man. I'm, I'm very grateful for to be able to do my art full time and and do it with vigor, you know. So, yeah, that's that's what's happening in the in the short term. Yeah, busy man. There's no wonder you need to be up at four thirty. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, I, you know hey, I gotta ask you, Keith. So, I mean, you you've had a professional background before you, you've done finish for music, right? Um, mm. And that's the thing, like, uh, when you're, it, it ties into my whole part of the honesty and integrity thing and discipline with respect to your art. I, when I had a regular job and I was doing something I didn't enjoy doing, I was just doing it to live. Um, I would never get up this early. Like, I would just get up at a suitable time to be in the office at whatever time. And now, it's like, no, I'm, I'm doing things. What is fueling me to get up this early it doesn't even feel like I'm getting up early. It doesn't even feel like I'm sacrificing the Netflix binge watch because uh, it's in a pursuit of a destiny, you know, in a vision. So I, I don't know, do you feel that way? Because that's what powers me. Like I don't, 4.30, I used to scoff at that, but now it's like, oh, it's whatever, you know? Yeah, necessary. I mean, it's, it's a really, it's a great question, actually. So when I was in corporate, I was fortunate. I've had an, and I had a job, a professional career, and a job in corporate as well, which was uh, like a headhunter in the city. Crazy long hours, um, you know, big time Charlie stuff. And I actually, I loved it. It was a job that I, I thrived in and I loved. And consequently, I was up at the crack of dawn on the personal development stuff, fueling that. But the job before that that I didn't love. I wasn't up at the crack of the door of crack of dawn fueling that. And when I was doing my corporate, I was also doing music. So I was burning the candle at both ends, DJing on the weekends. And pff, I mean, it, it was mad. I it couldn't sustain it. I think it was about three and a half years. And then uh, my young lady and I were like, no, nah, this is this a kill us. If we keep doing this, so we'll, we'll have to move on. But you are right, because now running FMM now on the weekends when I don't necessarily have to work and I'll put that in like inverted commas. I typically will be. And even if I have time off, if I, if I need time off three days is pretty much the amount of time that I will want to be away from anything that's 
like work related before I start to get the itch to get back involved. I want to be teaching people, helping people, creating something new, building a piece of content, whatever it might be. I, I am drawn back to it. So yeah, the, the the sort of the more I talk through it, the more I'm like, yeah, no, you're you're bang on the money when I think about it, because this is my passion. It's what lights me up. And, and my wife, she's exactly the same. So we are constantly drawn back into it. We walk the dog and it's like five minutes in before we're like, I've just had this idea. Could we do this? And we're both yeah. talking about it again. So yeah, when you, I think when you eat, sleep and breathe something, it doesn't feel like a chore. I think it becomes an addiction, I think. Yeah, yeah. And that's one I think if there's any downside to it, it's it's that. It's I uh I just sometimes I'll be I'll be frank, I just don't know when to turn it off. And it's very hard for me to like it's funny, like so we're as we're having this con uh, as talking to somebody about rest balance and, and productivity and how important rest is and I hey I'm I'm all for it. Get get your eight hours sleep or whatever um but take a week off huh <laughs> what that's, that's that's real hard for me yeah a little, it's a little hard but you know sometimes you got to do it <laughs> yeah fair. totally well look man it's been an absolute pleasure i have loved talking to you from from start to finish i I want to really extend my gratitude, uh, not just for your time, which is, is super valuable, but for your attention um, and for everything that you've shared. It's It's been really deep. And it's, as I said, it, there's so much echoes back that I believe in as well. And I think when we talked before, we immediately felt a connection and a, a synergy. And you've got some really great ways of explaining things and perspectives it's clear you've invested a lot of time in thinking about these things as as well and to be able to come on to and to share that for me you know this has been an absolutely fantastic episode so i just want to sign off by saying a huge thank you to you for this yeah thank you and uh, the feelings uh very mutual as well i thoroughly enjoyed this uh conversation it's great thank you for having me appreciate it yeah uh, and, and and the other thing is that we'll definitely tie this down we'll have a, a like a deep we're pro we're going to a proper deep one i think uh quite a lot of the, the listeners to this do like do like that stuff so we'll have one where maybe we'll let ourselves go into the, the really deep kind of meta stuff and explore some yeah. of that because sure holistically everything in life does affect the creativity and all the things that we do that we have to keep every plate spinning you let one of those bad boys drop and the whole thing crashes and you're building it back up so i think that would be a, a great uh, conversation i'd be delighted if if you'd uh, come back and join us for another episode well, totally down for that i think it's yeah i'm totally up for that that'd be great brilliant demure absolute legend thank you buddy take care thank you all the best